This sermon was preached at Jerseyville Baptist Church on April the 14th, 2024. It is the 12th and final sermon in this series on the Ten Commandments, entitled The Ten Commandments and Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 20. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. For our second scripture reading, I will read Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. The only story that we have of Jesus between his birth and the start of his ministry is when he was in the temple at 12 years old. Luke tells us that Jesus' family went to Jerusalem every year to celebrate the Passover. This particular year, when they returned home, Jesus stayed behind. In a panic, Mary and Joseph returned to Jerusalem and diligently searched before eventually finding him in the temple. What was Jesus doing? He was sitting in the temple courts, listening to the teachers of the law and asking them questions. Even as a boy, Jesus loved to ask questions, and his insights amazed the people. What this account reveals is that the law was an integral part of Jesus' religious experience growing up. It was because of the law 
that his family went to Jerusalem and celebrated the Passover. It was the things of the law that were the subject of the conversations that he had in the temple. He knew the law, and he lived by the law. And today, we are going to conclude our series on the Ten Commandments by having our minds and hearts drawn to Jesus Christ and his understanding of the law, including the Ten Commandments. And we will do so by turning to two texts from the Gospel of Matthew. First, we will reflect briefly on Matthew 5, 17 to 19, under the heading, Jesus' relationship to the law. And our second heading will be Jesus' summary of the law as we turn to Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus' relationship with the law. We've already seen that the law was central to Jesus' experience growing up. Well, what about during his ministry? What role did the law play in Jesus' life and teaching? In the Sermon on the Mount, The Apostle Matthew records Jesus saying that he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them, Matthew 5.17. Jesus was aware that some would misunderstand his teaching because he talked about the law and applied it like no one ever else had. Because Jesus did not handle the law as the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day, he knew from the outset of his ministry that they might see him as being anti-Moses and anti-law because he did not fit into their preconceived notion. He didn't fit into the box that they had constructed. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew how they might twist his words. To make his position clear, Jesus says in Matthew 5 that he is neither anti-Moses or anti-law. He is not against these things. He has come not to destroy or abolish the law or the prophets. Instead, he says that the law will endure until everything is accomplished and that those who do and practice these things will be called great in the kingdom of God. Jesus did not come to abolish. Instead, he came to fulfill his ministry. What he teaches and preaches is not only in harmony with the Old Testament, but it is the fulfillment of it. A right understanding of what is contained in the Law and the Prophets leads to Jesus Christ. The Law anticipates him, his life and his mission, which includes his suffering, death, and resurrection. The problem that the Law seeks to address is how can a holy God dwell among sinful people? How can he live with the people of Israel? God is holy. Caleb played the hymn during the offering, Holy, holy, holy. God is holy. He is radiant. His eyes are too pure to look upon unrighteousness. How can such a glorious and perfect being dwell in the presence of sinners. And what the law does is provide a way whereby God's justice can be satisfied and where he can be present in the midst of the nation of Israel, where he can be their God and they can be his people. The paradigm involves dealing with the guilt of people's sin through sacrifice. The law declares that by the shedding of blood, by the death of a substitute, the people can be purified and their sin forgiven. However, the paradigm of the law is intentionally incomplete and insufficient. It doesn't take very long to see that the Old Testament structure doesn't work. The blood of animal sacrifices is not good enough to atone for the weight of human sin. The priests who offer up these sacrifices are sinners themselves. And so they cannot bring other sinners into a complete reconciliation with God. The commands of the law are not able to keep the people in check. The law is not the means whereby a sinner can be permanently cleansed. There needs to be a better way. And even though it is not the answer in and of itself, what the Old Testament does 
what the law does is look towards something greater. It announces something is coming. God is going to do a greater work. And Jesus says, what is set forth in the law and the prophets anticipates him. He is the answer. Jesus is the answer. But the religious leaders of his day were not looking for an answer because they were determined to make the Old Testament system work. They thought that they could keep the commandments sufficiently. They believed that if they worked really hard and if they detailed what each command meant, then it would be enough for God. They thought that they could earn God's favor. And Jesus says that they don't understand what the law is about and what it really teaches. The law communicates that no one is righteous. No one keeps all of the commands. And therefore, they need a savior. They need a better priest who would offer up a better sacrifice. And as a result of this better sacrifice, they would be brought into a closer relationship with God who would give them better promises. Jesus' point in Matthew 5 is that the law and the prophets anticipate a way to God that will be sufficient and effective, which will allow sinners to be reconciled to God and dwell with him forever. And this way, Jesus says, is himself. When the law is rightly understood, it points clearly to Jesus Christ. The very fundamental question, how can a holy God dwell with sinful people, is answered in Christ. By his sacrifice, Jesus cleanses his people of our sin. And his righteousness is credited to us. Only one person ever kept the law perfectly. Only one person ever kept the Ten Commandments. And that was Jesus Christ. And by faith in him, not only are our sins removed and taken away and nailed to the cross, but his perfect righteousness, the righteousness that kept the law of God without exception, is given to us. And when this great exchange happens, we can have confidence that we will be able to live with God in his perfect heaven forever. The law looks to Jesus. It was designed to prepare the people for his coming. Remember that after Jesus rose from the dead on the road to Emmaus, he opened up the scripture to two of his distraught disciples, showing them that according to the Old Testament, according to the law, it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer, die, and rise again. He showed them how the law and the prophets anticipated his coming and how he fulfills the scriptures. What he did and why he did it is all found in the Old Testament. And so, with that in mind, Jesus says, don't think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. And as we narrow our scope when it comes to not thinking of the law in general, but to the Ten Commandments, as we have seen in previous messages, Jesus did not abolish them. He didn't say they don't matter, they're irrelevant, but rather he taught how they are to be rightly understood and applied. The religious leaders of the day thought that the keeping of the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law was the path to earning God's favor. Jesus teaches that these things are not the means of earning God's favor. What they are first is a mirror that reveals the state of our hearts and shows us that we need a savior. They teach us that we cannot please God in our own strength. We need Jesus. And then secondly, Jesus applies the Ten Commandments to the lives of his followers. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. But those who are committed to following Christ, well, we are to live lives of obedience. 
But Jesus amplifies the commands because what God expects of his people is not an external obedience only. The righteousness that those who are kingdom citizens strive for flows from a heart that has been transformed by the Holy Spirit. If we truly are God's children, if we have come to him by faith, then we will have a new heart, a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. And our words, our actions, and our thoughts are to be governed by our allegiance to Jesus. And since God is love, our hearts are to be saturated by love. And that brings us to our second point, Jesus' summary of the law, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Throughout his ministry, Jesus frustrated his opponents. They did not understand him. They did not like him. They did not appreciate what he said and that the crowds were enamored with him. His opponents wanted to erode his popularity. Matthew tells us in chapter 22 that after the failed attempts of the Sadducees to trap Jesus, the Pharisees conferred together. And one of them, an expert in the law, brought a question to test him. His question is, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now this may seem like a wonderfully insightful question and a riveting discussion topic. But we are told that it was designed to test Jesus. Because they misunderstood him, his opponents expected that his answer, that in his answer, Jesus would say something against the law. By this time, despite what Jesus had said in Matthew 5, the religious elite clearly thought of him as being anti-Moses and anti-law. And so they expected that his answer would reflect that. So they devised this question, hoping that in his response, he would discredit himself in the eyes of the crowd who revered Moses and who had been taught to follow the law their entire lives. But Jesus does not get trapped or tricked. What is the greatest commandment in the law? There are hundreds of commands in the Old Testament. How can they be boiled down to just one? This question and its intention provides no difficulty for the Savior. In his answer, Jesus says that there are two interrelated commands, which are the first and the second. To love God, and to love others. If we are fully committed to loving God and loving others, according to the biblical understanding and expectation of love, then we will keep the rest of the commandments. Jesus declared in verse 40 that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In his answer, Jesus not only demonstrated that he valued the law and the prophets, but he gave a true and effective summary of them. In Mark's record of this interaction, he notes that even the one asking the question that was designed to trap Jesus could not help but express his amazement at an affirmation of Jesus' answer. So let us conclude our series on the Ten Commandments by reflecting on the commands that Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our Lawgiver, says are the two greatest the commands which summarize the Ten Commandments and the rest of the exhortations in the law. First, love God. Jesus' direct answer to the question of what is the greatest command is to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus provides a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. They can hardly accuse him of not revering the law when he directly cites the law in response to the question of what is the greatest commandment. And it's a good summary because if an individual loves God so completely and passionately, then they will surely follow the rest of the commands that God has given. For example, love for God 
will drive an individual to worship him exclusively and rightly. The second commandment is as follows. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. In this command, God says that there are essentially two groups of people. On the one hand, there are those who worship idols, those who revere things other than God. And he says, they are those who hate me. But in contrast, on the other hand, there are those who do not worship idols, but they worship the true and living God. And he says, they are those who love me. In that commandment, we see these ideas of love, worship, and obedience are all interrelated. You can't separate one from the other. If we love God, we will worship him and obey him. And we will obey him because we understand by love that he cares for us. And that what he commands is for our good. Jesus says, if our heart is right towards God, then everything else will fall into place. We are to love him, the Savior says, with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We are not to return the greatness of the love that God has for us with half-hearted love. We are to love him because he first loved us. And think of the love that God has for us. Think of the love that he has for you. He showered his infinite and abundant and powerful love on us. And we are to respond by loving him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And loving God in this way means that we are to love God first and foremost. There is to be no one or nothing that we desire more than God. In response to the question, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6. And remember the situation that the nation of Israel is in when they receive this command. They are surrounded by nations who have all sorts of different gods. Each individual nation had a plethora of deities. They would worship multiple gods. And then there was also the danger of syncretism, which is when you combine the worship of deities. So it could be they worship the true and living God, but they also combine the worship of him with the worship of other gods from the nations around them. In the midst of this environment, where there are all these competing deities, they are told that their love for God is to be exclusive. He is the true and living God. He is their God who has loved them who is committed to them, and who has promised to bless them in unimaginable ways. He is the God who has entered into a covenant with them. He does not and should not share their hearts or our hearts with anyone or anything else. Jesus has a rightful and an exclusive claim to our affection. And sadly, we are quick to look for things and people to adore and to idolize. But only when God is at the center of our lives, only when he is that which we desire and love more than anything else, will our lives be rightly oriented. A right love of God is an exclusive love. It will not permit any competitors. We are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and some instances in the scripture say, strength as well. We are to love him with the totality of our being. We are to love God with our thoughts. Loving God with our thoughts means that we are to have right and true thoughts of him. God is a God who makes himself known. He reveals himself to us. We love him. We make the effort to know him better. It's easy to say, I love God, and have 
the God you love be a God of your own devising. We talked about the danger of this when we reflected on the second commandment. Humanity is prone to refashion the God of the Bible in a more palatable and comfortable way. We like this about God, so we'll keep that. But we don't like that about God, so we'll reject that. And in the end, we have a God that we've constructed in our own minds. We have a false God. However, we are to love him for who he is. That means that we are to love him for all of his attributes and qualities. We love him for his holiness. We love him for his righteousness. We love him for his justice, his mercy, his love, his power, and his grace. And we can go on and on. We love him because he is so great and awesome. In addition, we love him as our father. If we are in Christ, then our relationship with God is that of a father and a child. And we love him with our thoughts when we recognize that God is our loving and kind Heavenly Father who cares for us and who is faithful to his promises. He loves us as our Father, and we are to love him with a childlike, faith-filled, respectful, trusting, confident love. We are to set our thoughts on the goodness and greatness of God. We are to recognize that he is good and lovely and meditate on and delight in his wonderful attributes and the numerous expressions of his love towards us. We're to love him in our thoughts and we're to love him in our actions and words. We express our love for God by how we live our lives. It is out of love that we are to be intentional in serving God and obeying him. God does not need our help. He does not need our acts of service. But the Holy Spirit has gifted us so that we might participate in the work of God in the world. We love God when we work for him with the motivation of seeing him honored and exalted. We want to be lights in this world. We show our love for God through obedience. 1 John 5, 3 through 5. The apostle writes, In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And sometimes you maybe want to pause when you're reading the scripture. In fact, this is love for God. And then what would you expect? What would you expect that someone like John, who had followed Christ from the beginning, what would you expect that he would say? This is what love for God looks like. It says, love for God is to keep his commands. And then he says, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Why are his commands not burdensome? Because we obey him out of love. It's our love that compels us to want to obey. And we recognize that in obedience we are drawn closer to him. And that's what our heart desires. If we have a right love of God, if we seek to express our affection for him, then we will obey him. And then in addition to thinking about loving God with our actions, that will include loving God with our words. We show our love for God when we speak to others about him. We talk about what we're interested in. We talk about that which gets us excited, that which we love. And so we should be quick to talk to other people about God. And when we do so, we show our love for him. And we want to talk to people about him, those who don't know Christ, because we want them to love God like we love him. When we've tasted how beautiful and wonderful and glorious and satisfying God is to our souls, we want other people to have that same experience, don't we? And we can also speak to God 
in prayer and sing to God in worship. We are to love him with our actions, including with our words. We are to love God in what we do. And we are to love him by trusting him. We show that we honor, esteem, and love God by trusting in his character and his words. This is what God wants, for people to trust him. He has revealed himself to us and given to us great and precious promises so that we will believe in him and take him at his word. What is faith? In a book I was reading this past week, the authors note that the current understanding of many in our world is that faith is belief without evidence. One author who holds to such a view writes, faith is the word one uses when one does not have enough evidence to justify holding a belief, but one just goes ahead and believes anyway. And that is definitely not how the Bible understands faith. Faith is trusting in the evidence that we have been given. God has given an abundance of evidence that he is a God who fulfills his promises. God will do what he says. Not one of his words will fail to come to pass. And we show our love for him when we take him at his word. Our faith flows from our love of him. It was an expression of faith and love on Mary's part when the angel came to her and told her all that was going to happen and Mary said, may your word be fulfilled. Mary was full of faith and love towards God. We are to love God with our heart, soul, and mind, and with our strength. We are to be committed to him. We are to, we are to appreciate who he is and what he has done. And when we do, love should well up in our hearts. Well, how can we grow in our love for God? Maybe you're convinced that love for God is important, but you're looking for ways to grow in love. How can I love someone that I can't see? How can I love someone in whom there is such mystery? Well, we can grow in our love for God by increasing our knowledge of him. Again, these ideas of knowing God and loving him are interrelated. And so we read his word. We reflect on his character, his attributes, his greatness, and his actions. The more exalted our understanding of God is, the more informed we are about who God is, the more awesome and lovely he will appear to us. We can also grow in our love for God by reflecting on his love for us. We think about God's heart. And we see the numerous ways in which God's love has been expressed. Whether it's personal things that God has done for us. We look at our lives. We reflect on our experience. And we're thankful to God for how he has loved us. The family and friends that he has given to us. The church that he has given to us. There's so many things that we have to be thankful for material blessings, physical blessings, relational blessings. And then we can think of the expressions of his love for us on an objective scale, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. The love of God is so great and awesome and powerful, and we reflect on his love for us. We are drawn to love him in response. In addition, we can grow in our love by talking to others about God. We can have God-centered conversations with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We can talk about who God is. We can share experiences and insights with one another that magnify the beauty of God. We can ask each other, how do you grow in your love of God? Or how have you seen God's love in your life? And we can grow in our love for God 
by talking to him. We have to remember that God is patient and caring. And he desires that we bring all of our burdens to him. And when we realize that he is such a wonderful, loving, compassionate being, when we realize that the things that weigh us down, he cares about, that magnifies our love for him. And we can go to God in faith, asking for the Spirit to draw our hearts and affections closer to him. One way that we can grow in our love for God is to ask him to help us grow in our love for him. The greatest commandment, Jesus says, is that we are to love God. And then Jesus not only gave them one answer, but he gave them a second answer. The second is like it. We are to love others. Love God, love others. Jesus, again, quoting from the law, said that the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbors as ourselves. And this is a quote from Leviticus 19.18. And again, Jesus upholds the law and shows his opponents that his teaching and his mission is in harmony with the law that they esteem. And this commandment is very, re- is very relevant for all people. We are created to be social beings. We were designed to live in community. It is not God's intention for us to be hermits, secluded from society. We are to live with one another, and our relationships are to be saturated by love. How are we to love others? Jesus says to his disciples in John 13, 34 and 35, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The command that Jesus quoted in Leviticus was written written 1,500 years before what Jesus said in John 13. So the command is not new in John 13, in the sense that the command to love has never been spoken by God before. It's new in that the Savior has given a new standard of what loving one another looks like. We are to love each other with a Christ-like, sacrificial love. Just prior to commanding his disciples to love, Jesus took on the role of a lowly servant and humbly washed their feet. He said in John 13, 14 and 15, Now that I your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Washing feet is not part of our custom today. But even though it's not part of our regular lives, it doesn't take very much imagination to realize what a humbling act it is. And what an expression of sacrifice and servanthood it is. When Jesus talks to them about the fact that he washed their feet, he emphasizes his position and authority over them. He says, I am your Lord and your teacher. They are the disciples and followers. As disciples, they are to do what he does. They are to walk in his footsteps. And what kind of footsteps Does Christ leave? Jesus came to serve. He came to minister, to care for, to encourage, to bless others. He even and especially cared for those who were outsiders, those who had been pushed to the margins of society, those who felt that they didn't belong anywhere. Jesus said, come to me. And what did he do? He washed feet. And we are to do likewise. The Apostle John understood the message that Jesus was teaching. He wrote in 1 John 3, 16-18, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, 
Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. What a challenging command. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Loving other people to that extent, to the extent that Jesus calls us to, is not easy. There are so many benefits of being part of a church community. And one of the blessings is that we all have a lot of opportunities to grow in grace by showing love to one another. We're called to be devoted to one another, to esteem others, to put their needs above our own. And we read those commands, and then we look at our brothers and sisters and think, does Jesus mean that person? Does Jesus really expect me to love the individual who did that? And the answer is yes. Have you ever wondered what kind of dynamics there would have been in the early church? There are some strong personalities. Were Peter and Paul that easy to get along with? How well did people of different backgrounds and ethnicities interact? Remember, it took a lot for the Jews to understand that the Lord was at work among the Gentiles as well. That they were all united in Christ as one people. How could they have that shift in thinking that these people who I had been grown up, raised to think are my enemies, are now my dearest and closest brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we know in Acts 6 that the reason why the first deacons were called to office was to solve a problem. And the problem was that the Gentile widows were not being treated as well as the Jewish widows. And what kind of strife and bitterness and contention did that all lead to? And then Philippians 4, there's the issue of these two ladies, Udiah and Syntyche, these two Christ-loving ladies were at each other and needed someone to come alongside and make peace. Love is hard, but love is of God. Listen to the powerful words of John from 1 John 4, 7-12. to Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. If we have a relationship with God, then love will flow from us. Love for God and love for others. Others, those whom God loves. He continues, Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We are motivated to love each other because we have become the objects of such a great, compassionate, powerful, unconditional love. When we delight in the love that God has for us, when we are joyful for his love, how can we not respond by loving others? John concludes, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Think about that statement. No one has seen God. Where does that come from? Why does, God, why does John include that at this point? No one has seen God, but we make God visible to one another and to the world by our love. If we love one another, then God lives in us. An evidence that God is present in our lives, that we are truly believers, is our love for each other. And God's love is made complete in us. 
That's another head scratcher, isn't it? Wasn't God's love made complete at the cross? John says God's love is made complete when the church is a place of love. When his love in us compels us to love one another in Christ-like unity. Let us love one another, for God loved us, and he is love. Well, what practical steps can we take to ensure that we grow in love for one another? And first is to pray. I cannot think of a greater way of growing in love for someone than to pray. We pray for them. We live in a culture that is quick to dehumanize people. And when we dehumanize someone, it's easy to treat them with contempt. But when we pray for someone, we humanize them. When we pray, we become aware of their needs and desires, their weaknesses and burdens. We see them when we pray for them, not as those who should be despised, but those who need grace. We are to pray for them, and we are to pray with them. Hearts are bound together when we pray together. It's hard, and it takes a lot of stubbornness to persist in bitterness and anger towards someone when you honestly pray together. In addition, we are poised to grow in love when we view others and ourselves as works of grace. We ourselves are a work of grace. We need God's grace. We need his saving grace. We need his daily grace. And when we recognize that, we have a humble view of ourselves. It's impossible for a proud heart to love as Christ loves. If we want to grow in love for one another, we need to cultivate a heart of humility. We are to view ourselves as an object of grace, and we're also to view the other person as an object of grace. And that means first that we see them as they truly are, which is a child of God. God loves them. God set his grace upon them and has called them to be his child. And we are to value those whom God has loved that much. Those whom God calls his precious children. And then also when we think about the fact that other people are works of grace, that means we're to cut them some slack. We all have blind spots. But we're to remember and think about How do we want others to respond to what? What kind of grace and love do we want other people to show towards us? And then we're to show that to them. And finally, we grow in love by reflecting on the example of the Savior. That's what John did in these verses from 1 John 4. He reminded them of the love of the Father in sending the Son, and he reminded them of the love of the Son in laying down his life for us. Immersing ourselves in the truth of God's love will prepare us to be loving towards others. Let us love. I want to conclude with some words from William Hendrickson on the passage from Matthew 22. This godly man writes, This twofold command, love for God and for the neighbor, is the peg on which the whole law and prophets hang. Remove that peg and all is lost. For the entire Old Testament, with its commandments and covenants, prophecies and promises, types and testimonies, invitations and exhortations, points to the love of God, which demands the answer of love in return. If God so loved us that he sent his only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins, shall we not respond in love? Love for God? and love for one another. May we be known by our love. Amen. Let us pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father, we pray that you would be at work in our hearts, that love would overflow from our hearts. First and foremost, love for you, and then love for one another. And our Father, we pray that you would write these words on our hearts and apply them in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.